Welcome back to the Ed Morrissey Show. Joining us as always, the Prince of Twitter, the Regent of RedState.com, Andrew Malcolm at AH Malcolm on the Twitters, and of course uh, over at RedState.com where he's in the VIP column. And Andrew, <coughs> this is a very special uh, version of the podcast because this is where we this is where we're going to issue our institutional endorsements. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Because you know. We don't want people canceling their subscriptions. We don't want our writers walking off because we didn't make an uh, we didn't make a, a an institutional endorsement. So here's my institutional endorsement: as managing editor of Hot Air, I am here to tell you what you should do, which is basically make up your own minds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I you mean, imagine, what a radical thought! I know it's unusual. I know it's unusual, but you know, maybe media shouldn't be telling voters how to choose right i mean it's it's fine if you know the the odd thing about this is is that i never really thought too much about what newspaper endorsements mean because they're usually so very predictable right you know that the washington post is going to is going to endorse the democrat presidential candidate in every single cycle right you know the la times is even more so going to do that. The New York Times will never endorse a Republican for president, ever. <laughs> All I have to do is read their newspaper, right? Yeah, yeah. And so the idea that this is meaningful, it, to me, is just laughable. I mean, I, yeah, yeah. No, we just told totally, it. It's yeah. totally ridiculous. You know, when I was younger and first got into this uh, journalism, uh, newspapers were predictable in that they endorsed Republicans because the owner wanted it. Uh, the LA Times endorsed Republicans all the way through. Um, and then in 70, 72, they got burned, or was it, yeah, 72, and because Nixon got caught in Watergate, so they didn't endorse. And then they stopped endorsing the LA Times from 76 uh, to 80. And I was there when they started again, and this was considered a big deal. I think newspaper endorsements, to the extent that they're still bother making them, uh, have some weight locally. You know, if, 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 uh, if, there's, if the lone daily newspaper in um, XYZville uh, endorses so and so for mayor. I think that probably has some weight because people yes. don't don't people don't pay attention uh, to that. And maybe up to the house, the house member. But other than that, uh, they don't. It's an exercise in self-importance, as you say. And and uh, uh, well, the people are waiting to hear what we say. No, no, they're not. And they. If they hadn't made us think about it themselves, no one would have noticed. So uh, the LA Times, they have been predictable in modern times for Democrats. Um, and, uh, but, <laughs> if they, yeah, that's right. Ever since 2000, the LA Times has endorsed um, Democrats. Yeah. And and some some Republicans, like the one I worked for, George W. Bush, wouldn't even bother going in for an interview because it was a waste of time. The most important thing that candidates have in campaigns are time, is time. Right. Uh, and they're not going to waste it in an hour and a half um, blowing smoke, uh, having smoke blown at them by the editorial board and aggressive questions looking for angry quotes so you know it's it's not a not a, i remember um uh, george w bush in the campaign was speaking i forget where but at some big new york hotel and it was in the campaign and uh the news maybe it was the newspaper publishers association or something anyway um, the little Ponce, who was a uh, publisher at the time, uh, stood up and asked when he, when he was going to uh, meet with the LA Times. And there was a bunch of us in the kitchen listening to all of this 
we just burst out laughing because he was never going to go to the New York Times. Uh, it's just it, it was just a, a total waste of time. And right. for them, it's a it's a badge of well, he came in to seek our support, but we're not going to give it to him. Blow eh. away. <laughs> Yeah, the whole thing is just sort of this pumped up self-importance. Yeah. And look, I mean, I you know, um, the uh, Sun Xiang family owns, um, Patrick Sun Xiang owns the Los Angeles Times now. And he, there was no explanation as to why he shelved the, the already written endorsement of Kamala Harris, not initially at least. Um, but then it came out that, apparently the daughter is the one that actually uh um, she's she's very radical she's very, very radical left and she was unhappy that kamala harris hadn't come out in full support of the palestinians in opposition to israel exactly uh, so exactly so and did you did you see the the nation unendorsed kamala harris too the no same i missed that you know the nation you know this and I know this, but for those of you who are watching this podcast and don't know what The Nation is, The Nation is one of the oldest progressive left publications in the nation and in the nation. And they've had some very good writers there, very good writers that I completely disagree with, but they've had some very good writers there um, who take like who take things seriously, sometimes a little too seriously. But but I mean, you know, it's 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 been a fairly consistent platform. This isn't like the New Republic that just went nut bar left um, after Chris Hughes bought them up. Um, they, they've always been pretty consistent, but apparently the interns got hold of the printing presses this week and decided that they're going to unendorse Kamala Harris for the same reasons that um, that Patrick Shun uh, Xiang's daughter decided that she didn't want to have the paper issue an endorsement. Um, I'm, I'm joking about the interns taking control of this. I'm trying to think of the writer I know, John. Um, oh gosh, I actually met him during the um, 2008. He was at the 2008 convention, yeah. and and I appeared with him and uh, Dave Barry on some TV panel thing at the. And he was a super nice guy. He's the guy who wrote um, the Sterile Cuckoo, um, which they made into a movie with Liza Minnelli, which was very good. Um, where um, it, was, it was, it was really about this guy's first year in college. I, I can't think of his name now. It's, it's going to yeah, come. But, to... Well, what about him? But he was a very nice guy. I mean, we completely yeah. agreed on the issues, but he presented himself very well. He had a rational thought process. I just complete. We just completely disagreed. We had different values, and that's fine. Um, uh, and I really enjoyed talking with him. I enjoyed debating with him. Um, you know, and. I'd only been in the business five years at that point. So I was a little, you know, intimidated being on some of those panel shows. And he didn't, he didn't take advantage of that. He was, he was a gracious, um, he was a gracious individual. Um, so I've had, and, and I've read other things at the nation. And again, I disagree with them, but they're usually well-written, well-structured. They make a good, they make an argument at least, but this was just nut bar stuff. You know, they're not going to endorse her because she's too, Pro so is did, did this guy who's nameless did he's the guy that wrote for no 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 no. Oh. no 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 i think these were i think these were the younger activists at the nation <laughs> that wrote that mm -hmm. uh, i think it was unsigned but i mean again it's this sort of sense of self-importance this inflated self-importance i can't you know i argue every day you argue every day we're going to get to some of your arguments because they're good especially in light of what happened at Madison Square Garden um, yesterday and the run-up to it. But I'm not telling people that this is how you should vote. I will reveal how I vote as a form of transparency, but I always say this isn't an endorsement. I'm just telling you where I'm at. I'm just telling you what I did. You know, I voted for Marco Rubio in the primary in, what was it, 2016. And I wrote, hey, I'm and the Rubio campaign, of course, took it as an endorsement. They asked me to speak to the to their, <laughs> their to their staff, and I did. It was like, yeah, sure, why not? I'll speak to them. You know, I'll rally them up at the um, at, at the uh, it was the state convention, I think, where I was at. I was like, yeah, sure, you know, I'm happy to do it. And um, but I just don't do endorsements because I can't imagine somebody saying, 
I don't know how I'm going to vote until Ed Morrissey tells me how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's it's hilarious. I don't I don't talk about uh, who I'm voting for, but I do talk about the process. That's that's my niche. I think is trying to explain how this stuff works. <clears throat> yeah. And and if you read my stuff, you can guess. <laughs> Some people in the comments this weekend uh, guessed wrong, but you could you can guess uh, you know where where my support would be. I've always voted. The first time I voted was sixty four. Um, I cried in the booth because it was such a moving, exciting moment. Yeah. And even when I lived in Asia, I voted absentee, and um, I got my ballot in on time. And, yeah, well, there's a whole other thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I voted for all, all different, not communists, but I voted for all different sides. And I have changed my party registration in case anybody wanted to go and look and check. I, I, I don't think anybody ever did. And I don't bother with it anymore. But um, I, ju I just think that people, would want to read, and this is just me, I just think people would want to read um, people that they trust, that they think uh, shoots straight, and that tells them something that they didn't know. And from my experience in mainstream media, a lot of years uh, on both coasts and in politics and in state government, I hope there's some value in explaining how things work, but I don't think anybody cares. I, my wife doesn't care, so if she doesn't care. <laughs> yeah, um, I was uh, I was joking around with uh, John Andrasik earlier today. Um, he was asking me how things are going at Hot Air. I said, well, you know, the traffic's good. You know, it's picking up. You know, there's a lot of interest in the in the thing. And I said, but I don't get the I don't get to see the really good numbers. I'm, I'm just telling you based sort of indirect, some indirect measurements I'm getting. And, and he, and he said, I thought you, I thought you owned the, I thought you owned that business. I said, no, 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 no. It's owned by Salem. You know, I, I said, I'm managing editor. Uh, the definition of which is he who shall be blamed when things go wrong. <laughs> and he, he sent me, I'm, I'm sure I'm not talking out of school. I'm sure he doesn't mind if I share this. He said, Oh, you mean a husband? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I told that to my wife and she says, that's right. That's, <laughs> that's right. right. That's right. But I mean, right. um, yeah, I mean, I can't imagine anybody seriously waiting to figure out, you know, how they're, how, you know, how they're going to choose an office until I tell them how to vote. I mean, yeah, I think, yeah, you, know, I think you figured it out by now, right? If you read the Washington Post, if you read the LA Times, who do you think they're backing? Just read the paper and you can figure it out. That's what, um, What's her name? The, pub the, the publisher during the Watergate era, Catherine um, Graham. Catherine Graham apparently got into an argument with LBJ because in uh, 64, she wasn't going, she didn't, they didn't issue an endorsement. It was one of those years where they weren't issuing an endorsement. And he got angry with her over it. And she said, well, I just kind of assume that the readers who are reading my paper and, and seeing how we favor your <laughs> policies will figure out what it is that we're, uh, you know, what it is that we're backing. And I, I mean, and I think it's a hell of a lot more obvious these days than it may have been in 1964. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It, ah. It's uh, self-importance. That's it. And I don't think people like that. It's not authentic. Uh, and authentic seems to have surged to the front of uh, important things these days that, that people look for in politicians or that they they don't see, and therefore they hold it against them. Um, <clears throat> and and that, you know, that comes from the fact that so much of our politics now is just visual. It's photo ops, it's rallies. You know, if anybody thinks that a Kamala Harris supporter or someone on the fence went to Trump's Ma uh, Madison Square Garden rally, they're out of their mind. It's just, yeah. it's just, it's just not happening. They're not persuading anybody. Those are events to get media attention for millions of people who didn't, who didn't go, and they're going to hear maybe a minute at the most of it, and they're going to like it or not like it. 
Well, I want to get to the, I want to get to the Madison Square Garden thing in a minute, but I want to stick with the Washington Post because the same time that they're reporting on the internal, you know, people quit their jobs at both papers because oh, the good riddance. Yeah, story. that's it. Yeah, right. Yeah. It, um, I call that self-selection, <laughs> Darwinian self-selection, probably <laughs> the careers. Um, I noticed that Jen Rubin wasn't one of the ones that quit, by the way, but I won't. I will say no more about that. But she was cheering on the guy that quit at the LA Times over this. And when her paper did it, suddenly all she wanted to do was wear a t-shirt and protest. So, you know, I'm just saying, I say no more about that. But, yeah. you know, the, the thing at the Washington Post, the way it was reported at the, at the New York Times and later at the New York Post, is that Bezos really wants to recalibrate the Washington Post. They've been talking about this now for months, right? He brought in... When Marty Baron left, Marty Baron, of course, is out there saying they're cowards for not writing this stupid endorsement thing. Um, Although he wasn't in charge, was he of, of opinion? He, well, he wasn't. Well, he was the publisher. He was the publisher, right? So they brought in William. I thought he was the editor. Oh. No, I think he was the publisher. He may have also been in charge of the opinion section, but he was a, he was the previous publisher, Marty Baron. The you know the the legendary Marty Baron, as they say these days, but. Um, they brought in William Lewis and William Lewis was over at the Wa Wall Street Journal for a while and uh, and uh, one of the tabloids, I think. And Bezos brought him in to because the Washington Post subscriptions were cratering. They're still cratering, right? Yeah. Now they're cratering yeah. even more. Um, and reportedly what he wants the paper to do is bring in more conservative voices in the opinion section, which is fine. It's great. I'd like to see some of my friends get opportunities to write for the Washington Post, and I have no problem with that. That's not really the problem, though. <laughs> First off, there's only two conservatives that I, two real conservatives uh, that are not part of the. Well, I'm conservative, but I am going with Kamala Harris because of you know norms sort of uh, people, and that's yeah. Jim Garrity, uh, who may not be voting for Trump as far as I know, and Hugh Hewitt, who clearly will be. Uh, they're both regular contributors. They're, I mean, they're both columnists there, and that's. Fair, but there's they've got like 20 columnists. And as far as I know, those are the only two that are really conservative, you know, that operate and, and argue on behalf of conservatism. Um, I wouldn't call them tokens. It's good that they're there. Um, and they do good work there. But honestly, it's it's not a lot, you know, there's not a lot of balance. And supposedly he wants to bring balance in on, on the opinion side. And, that's all fine and good, Andrew. But I really wanted to talk to you about this is that that's not really the issue. The issue is in the newsroom where right. you have a newsroom. The, the reporters and editors are all activists. They call, they come from an activist background. And the only way you're really going to shift that paper to be balanced in terms of its news delivery is basically to <laughs> get everybody to quit and bring people in who will do more traditional journalism, except where do you find those people anymore? Yeah. Because send them, the send, them send them to uh, uh, Vietnamese re-education camps. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't know how the uh, media in general, and specifically the Washington Post. Remember, they had a running total. Up, I think it was twelve thousand and something of of Trump lies every day. There was a new yeah. untruth and whatever, and you know they just haven't had time to get around to it with Biden. <laughs> it's just, oh, I mean, it's so transparent. Um, but what happened, I believe, and I touched on this in a recent column, was that uh, Watergate was a watershed moment uh, in journalism, uh, and it was a it was a uh, a magnificent expose of criminal undertakings by a presidential administration. And the impact was profound. Uh, uh, and the two main reporters are Woodward and Bernstein, and, and they did amazing jobs that, because they had sources they trusted, who trusted them. Uh, and they had a, pub or a, it wasn't a publisher, but they had an editor, um, Ben Bradley, who was, uh, who was all behind them. It may have been for ideological reasons, but it doesn't matter. It was something that needed exposing right. but a generation of of young people came from college a lot of them from the ivy league uh which has a common culture common what is what is the word group think 
uh, yeah. that that um, it was very exciting, and they wanted to be stars. Well, the, the power of Woodward and Bernstein when they became stars, but they didn't do this to become stars. They did it because it was a heck of a story. It was an historic story, and they worked it really, really well. Um, and this is before online. Uh, right. And I worked for the New York Times at the time, and it gave the Times conniptions. Uh, they always had something new that the Times was running to try to catch up with. Well, the generation of young people that came along that saw that, they were looking for stardom and fame. They weren't looking to be gumshoe reporters. Yeah. Uh, and so what, what has happened over time is that, you know, reporters were regular working Joes for most of American yeah. history, uh, American history, it's gumshoe guys that were out chewing cigars and talking to the Pauls and, and working. They weren't rich. They probably didn't go to college. Well, these people all went to college and they had that self-importance and educated and they wanted to fix things. They didn't want to tell good stories. That's why I got into journalism. I wanted to tell stories that would interest people. They didn't right. want to do that. They wanted to fix society, and that's what we're stuck with. And it got going; it's still going, and that's the woke culture uh, that is uh, pervasive at the moment. Some little fights by management to right the ship. Good luck to Jeff Bezos, and uh, I forget the guy's name who's the new editor at the New York Times. Uh, oh, at the New York Times, I don't know the one at the yeah, New York Times. Yeah. So, um, which is kind of good because. The reason you used to know them was they were always in fights with their own staff that were rebelling. And, you know, that in my yeah. days, in my days, that would have never happened. You want to rebel, um, hit the street. Uh, uh, we have, we, we have yeah. values and standards here. Well, and then coupled with this, and I'll try to make this brief, was uh, journalism got in trouble for being mainly white male domain, which it was. Uh, and it was, I don't want to say crude, it was close to crude. Um, uh, when I started the New York Times, they had spittoons in the newsroom and the guys had booze in the drawers and, and, uh, you know, for after the deadline. Um, and, um, uh, it, so they didn't have women and it was a group thing for men. And we've gone through that era now and the whole Me Too business and everything. And and suddenly in the late 80s and especially the early 90s, media got on a big push to right the ship, the gender and, and race-wise. And they promoted people uh, who uh, did not go through the usual traditional process. When I was at the started New York Times, there were copy boys and news clerks who had been that way for five and six years trying to become reporters. But in that time, I mean, that's hard, but yeah. in that, in that time, you absorb the culture, you hear the demand for facts, you, you absorb the importance of being right and honest. Well, there was a whole generation that was pushed through that didn't have that time. You remember Jason Blair, the guy, the guy yeah. in the New York times, um, he wrote some 600 stories in uh, four years on the New York Times, and they have appointed their own task force to investigate them. And a lot of them were false, made up, fictitious. He was an intern, I guess, for a few months. Then suddenly he's a reporter, and then quickly he's moved to be a prominent national reporter who made up an interview with that uh, American uh, female soldier who got captured and got rescued by the special ops in Iraq. He just made the whole thing. He never left Brooklyn. Um, and uh, uh, what was her name? Janet, Janet Cook on the Washington Post. And she uh, wrote the Pulitzer Prize winning feature story uh, about this poor black boy growing up in the ghetto and the traumas of his life. And it turns out he didn't exist. She made the whole thing up. Well, they had reporters in the early days who were off track. I mean, they maybe believed Stalin or, or 
uh, or or whatever, but they didn't make stuff up. My God, right. um, and uh, so so they're stuck with that now. And you know, you can't go in and say, "Well, there's too many women, there's too many blacks, there's too many people that that didn't spend time learning." You can't. You're stuck with it. They, they made the mistake. They made the correction, and they're paying the price for the urgent correction. Yeah, uh, and that's going to last a long time. I'm I'm sad and, for American media, and that's the reason why you know the Axios has a story out today saying the era of big media is dead, and they're blaming the fact that people can get their that people have choices, and it's like that's not the reason why big the era of big media is dead. The era of big media is dead because they committed suicide with their credibility, and. It was because rather than stick with that model that you're talking about, the model that at least produced um, trust reporting that you could trust, right? They hired a bunch of kids out of um, college who who went who became activists in college and went into journalism so they could continue their activism with a paycheck, and that's the reason why so many of these people now are freaking out because. The Washington Post won't write an editorial saying vote for Kamala Harris. I mean, the, the level of absurdity, the, the outrage is so out of proportion to the decision. I mean, it, I mean, you can make an argument that maybe they should, maybe they shouldn't. I get that. Why would you quit your job? <laughs> yeah. That I don't get. Why would you quit your job over it? I, I mean, the New, York, the New York Times did the same thing where they fired their editorial page editor and Barry Weiss and others who left yeah. um, um, because they were hired to diversify the authors and the opinions and voices on the editorial page of the New York Times. They yeah. did that. And then the woke news staff revolted when they dared to run an op-ed by Tom Cotton. Oh, oh my God, the New York Times reader. How, how did they survive? Words written by a Republican conservative. And, uh, you know, boom, that's where they... That's it made them unsafe. Words yeah. made them unsafe. At the New York Times, words made them unsafe. I mean, it's yeah. it's almost a parody of, of what newsrooms actually should be. And so, yes, I mean, the whole thing is absurd. They're, they're killing their own golden goose. I, I want to talk about the Madison Square Garden thing. In in connection to that, because that actually connects and in to con connection to the column. Yes. Right. <laughs> uh, and this is this is even better than a segue. It's actually real. Uh, sure. You wrote, and this was on I think uh, Thursday. Um, how did lying become so normal in public life and with no consequences? Well, as you're writing that, as you're publishing that, the Mainstream media went completely bonkers over the idea that Donald Trump was going to hold a rally at Madison Square Garden. And they got the idea from the Harris campaign that somehow this is a Nazi rally because the Nazis held a rally in 1939 at Madison Square Garden. The American Nazis held a, um, a, a, a rally in 1939, just before the war broke out, at Madison Square Garden. In the first place, it's not even the same building. <laughs> it's replaced. Secondly, you know who else has been at Madison Square Garden? Yeah. Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton has been there. George nope. W. Bush. I was there when George W. Bush was there in 2004 for the Republican convention. Democrats have held conventions there. Republicans have held conventions there. There's been a lot of people who are, it's, it's like saying, you know, the, the Nazis breathed oxygen. So Trump is breathing oxygen, so clearly he's a Nazi. I mean, yeah. it's it's absurd what the hell you know and and I, there probably are a large number of inattentive voters or people who might vote who who buy that who think yeah boy that's dangerous because they only hear part of it but i'm hoping that there's a larger number of americans who think like you that's freaking ridiculous well, I never knew that the Knicks, I never knew that the New York Knicks were a Nazi, were a Nazi gang. But, you know, you learn something new every day. I mean, yeah. don't the Knicks play at Madison Square Garden? Isn't that their, yeah. or at least oh, they yeah, used they to, right? And the yeah. Rangers, too. Imagine that. Red, white, and blue uniforms. Yeah, commies. Nazis, not commies. Nazis. Yeah. The commies, the commies are, are uh, uh, you know, um, Shea Stadium. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm joking. <laughs> They're a Columbia. Uh, 
They're at Columbia. They're at Col- well, yeah, they are. They kind of are at Columbia, but um, but I mean, we're talking about big media collapse, credibility collapse, and you're talking about how did lying become such a such a normal thing in our public life? And look, I am loath to um, absolve Donald Trump from part of that, but he's just. He's just the outcome of that. This stuff, this crap happened long before Donald Trump got involved in politics. You're seeing this right now. I mean, you've got MSNBC that was covering the rally, by the way, and they were intercutting clips from the 1939 Nazi rally in their coverage for no good reason other than to just say, oh, these guys are Nazis because they're at Madison Square Garden. Yeah, It's, it's shameful. I it's don't. shameful. It's absolutely shameful, and that's that was. And, that and was there's no point. consequences, and, and and they're preaching to their choir, which gets them all the more excited. And you know, Republicans preach to their own choir too. Uh, they do, and that's part of the, that's part of the problem with politics these days is the whole base turnout model, which is yeah, you know, you know, and I think Trump's getting away from that more in this cycle than he did in the previous two cycles, which is good. He's doing more retail politics too. But also, and this is your other column, right? <laughs> it's that he's a familial, familiar alternative to the status quo. And you talk about the looming dark disaster of Kamala Harris. Um, and she had every opportunity, I think, to position herself as some sort of change agent if she was willing to talk about what it was that she was changing other than all of her previous positions before yeah. she became vice president. Um, and But she couldn't tear herself away from her ideological roots, which are far left. And uh, she didn't want to alienate them the way Joe Biden didn't want to alienate progressives in his party and let us down the road of $5 trillion in new spending uh, for 9% inflation. Yeah, you know, and again, is this? It, this is it's. She's the incumbent vice president. She's running on the basis of the administration that just for the last three, almost four years now, and it's clear that voters aren't content, <laughs> to say the least, with the current status quo. So, if she was going to become the 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 new, you know, agent of change, she needed to put out. An agenda of change. Instead, she was copying and pasting the the um, issues page over from Joe Biden's campaign website, literally cu- cutting and pasting it to the point where you could see the code from Joe Biden's old website in it. If you peek behind, if you you know, if you took a look at the code behind the website, um, doesn't have anything. She's not offering anything. She's and all well, she's dishonest, right? right? I mean, that's oh, lying. Yeah. That's that's fundamentally that lying. And there will be no consequences, and so there will be more of it. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, so so disappointing. So you're saying, you know, obviously you're saying, you know, in your column that, you know, that familiarity from what we had four years ago, really five years ago, prior to the pandemic, right? Where this country was heading before the pandemic broke out was actually pretty good. And if you go back and take a look at the polling for right direction, wrong direction, it was actually the best ratings that that four years prior to March of 2020, that four years was actually the best period of that right, wrong direction polling in the last 15 years. Yeah. And, you know, rather than focus on things like, you know, honest differences about policies and stuff like that, the media is just going insane with this Nazi messaging, which is ludicrous and hasn't worked. Right. I mean, they've been trying to run this disqualification strategy for the last two years, and Donald Trump is just becoming more popular through it. So now I, I think that they're they're freaking out they're, because the big, you know, they're realizing that they don't really have any a whole lot of influence anymore on, on what voters think. No, no, they don't. And uh, they had the, their influence is negative. Uh, I mean, if, if you see. Uh, well, I, I, I don't watch MSNBC, but if you see some, <clears throat> the Washington Post say something, you go, okay, there's more to this, and this isn't the whole story. Therefore, it's a falsehood. Yeah. 
And I would I would add it to my column of Washington Post lies, uh, but I don't have one because it's not worth the time. And that's uh, the truth. <laughs> and that's the truth. We, we always tell the truth there. That's right. That's right. The truth. So just to, just to give you a, a little anecdote here. You know, I live in Central Texas. I've been here about three and a half years. And yesterday, Sunday, uh, I went to do early voting because it occurred to me that maybe it'd be easier for me to do it on the weekend rather than during the week, uh, or especially on election day, because we're going to be pretty busy on election day. So I asked my wife, she says, yeah, let's just go ahead and do it today. And it's been, I think, day five or six of early voting here in our central Texas county, um, which is a, basically a 60-40. And four years ago, it was 60-40 for Trump in this in the county that in which I live. I won't identify the county. And I thought, you know, it's this is great. They're going to open up at 1 o'clock in the afternoon on a Sunday. Uh, we had something to do at 2 o'clock. We had an appointment at 2 o'clock. I said, let's get over there when they open up or just after, and we'll get in there, we'll vote, we'll get right back. <laughs> I think I know what's coming. We drive over there, and the line was literally, we got we got there at like about 120, 125, and the line was literally around the block. And this is not a big, it's not a big county, right? Um, this is not part of the really urban setting sort of thing. This isn't Dallas. It's not Austin. It's not Houston. And um, and I said, man, I, I mean, I think we'd be standing out there for at least an hour before you even get inside the building at that rate. So so let's come back later in the day because they're open till six. Okay. They're open. <laughs> so we come back by at uh, about 4.15-ish, 4, 4.20, because we finished up what we were doing. It was an event that we had at church. We come back by. And the line is at the door. You know, it's a, I could see the door is popped open, somebody standing in the doorway, right? But that's it. I thought, oh, great. You know, it's calming down, it's not as busy. So, <laughs> so we go up, we park, we go stand in line. Almost as soon as I do that, I see a whole bunch of other people showing up <laughs> and Sure enough, the thing's starting to wrap around uh, into the parking lot again. It's wow. like, first off, great timing, right? But yeah. we still were in line for close to a half an hour before we got our ballots could sit down. So, I mean, and it's the ballot wasn't long. We didn't have local elections. So it was strictly um, state and federal and some some judicial elections, which, by the way, in Texas are partisan. You know, you know if they're Democrat or Republican, which is interesting. <laughs> uh, not, not every state does that. Um, and, you know, so probably, you know, I helped Marsha out with her ballot, uh, and then I did mine. And we were probably sitting down for 10 or 15 minutes tops. That's how many people were going through there on a Sunday afternoon when, let me remind everybody, football's on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Texans love football, right? I could not believe the level of turnout that I was seeing on a Sunday nine days before election day. And I am glad I'm not going there on election day because oh, Lord knows man. how long I'd have to stand out there. I actually brought my cowboy hat with me. Um, <laughs> I, thought I, was gonna, I, yeah. I thought I was going to need shade, right? And, yeah. So yeah, I mean, just, and this is anecdotally speaking, but the level of enthusiasm in a pretty red county is as high as I think I've ever seen it. I've been here for, this is my second federal election. I was here for the midterms. Um, and so this is the second one. And of course, the midterms probably wasn't as, we probably didn't have the same level of turnout for the midterm elections. But I mean, we still had a gubernatorial election on that ballot and all the other state offices were on that ballot. Uh, Ted Cruz is on this ballot too. So it's, it's, it's for Texans, it's president and Ted Cruz. Um, so, I mean, I, Honestly, I think that voter enthusiasm in, at least in, in terms of Republicans, is going to be pretty high in large part because what you're talking about is that in, in your column here, it's, I'm, I'm wrapping this back around to what you wrote, is that I think voters are very clear now about what the alternative to Trump actually was in 2020, and they don't want to have anything more to do with it, yeah. at least more of them 
are making that decision than the other decision. I think you're starting to see that in the polls. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. <clears throat> uh, in 2020, most of the Democrat voters admitted they were voting not for Joe Biden. That's how we got the nomination because nobody had an objection to him at the time. Not for Joe Biden, but they were voting against Donald Trump. And in this case, now that we've had four years of Biden-Harris, I think <laughs> the table has turned and uh, they're voting um, for Trump um, and against more Biden, which is what Harris is, probably even more extreme, certainly more empty. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that that's about it for this week. Go read Adam's, or, uh, sorry, not Adam, sorry, Andrew's columns. I'm thinking of Adam Baldwin. Go read it. Andrew's columns over at redstate.com because he's the prince of Twitter. Yeah. Adam is that's animal right. mother. You're the prince of and, Twitter. And yeah. don't forget about it. Do not forget that. Um, so, um, do you have any jokes of the week this week? I don't have a joke, but I have a funny story. Oh, good. That's uh, even in politics. I have tried to do pretty much everything, uh, reporting, going to conventions. I was a delegate, uh, at one convention. Um, and so when I was living in California, I, I volunteered, uh, for a small sum of money to be a poll worker, which is a very long day. It's like six in the morning till eight at night in this small mountain town, <laughs> I, it, which is, uh, I, I think, not heavily, but definitely more Democrat than Republican, as is a lot of California. Yeah. Um, so um, I was in charge at the ballot box. I couldn't touch the ballots, but I told people where to put it so to speak and <laughs> and i don't know yeah. what, what that meant for just a moment but yes okay yeah right so at one point the town plumber came in jeff and i mean everybody knew everybody mostly and so he comes in and there's no long line there is a line but it's not long so he comes in and he looks around at the it's what's like a tool shed didn't like a very large living room. He looks around and he says, I'm a Republican, can I vote here? And the head of the ballots says, not if you're a plumber. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought that just struck me as, as being so, so small town, so quick and so funny that they, you know, okay, you're a Republican, whatever, but we'll bar you some other way because of your profession. <laughs> pretty funny. That is, that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good thing. And in an isolated uh, mountain community, if you need a plumber, you need a plumber. You need a plumber. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to mess yeah. around with plumbers. That's it's all septic folks. You need a yeah. plumber. You definitely need a plumber. I was, um, my sister a long time ago got me this t-shirt and I haven't worn it very often. It's, the t-shirt just says, does this shirt make my head look bald? Right. <laughs> I actually wore that. I wore that to the polling place yesterday. And I got, I got quite a few laughs out of it at the polling place. I also you got a couple of laughs. With your hat on? Well, and that was, you know, that was the thing I'm there with my hat on and um the, the the first poll worker that commented on it just was laughing, you know, and we exchanged a few pleasantries. So we get done with the ballots, right? I go up there and I'm, you know, it's optical scan ballots. Thank God they changed the optical scan ballots rather than the computers. And I'm running it through to make sure it will clear. And the guy looks at me, he goes, I don't think that t-shirt makes your head look bald. So I lifted my head. I said, what about now? He goes, now, now you look bald. <laughs> so, yes. Um, all right, I've got a quick t-shirt. That's a good one. Your sister's oh, funny. Yeah, she, oh, yeah, she's got a wicked sense of humor. So um she, she gave me another one too. It said, uh, the people who put up with me on a daily basis, they're the real heroes. <laughs> <laughs> I wore that one out. I kind of wore that one out. I only wear that, I only wear that around the house now, but I used to get some uh, funny comments about that too. I got a joke for you, then we'll go ahead and get going. So Lion woke up one morning feeling rowdy. So he went out and cornered a small monkey and roared, who's the mightiest of all jungle animals? And the trembling monkey says, oh, you are a mighty lion. 
the lion's feeling pretty good. So he spots a deer and he runs up to the deer and bellows, who was the mighty of all jungle animals? And the deer says, oh, great lion, you are by far the mightiest animal in the jungle. The lion saunters off feeling pretty good. He sees the elephant over there and he runs up to the elephant and he says, who is the mightiest of all jungle animals? Without saying anything, the elephant grabs him with his trunk, slams him into a tree, stomps on him and walks off. <laughs> and the lion looks over and as he's walking up, he says, you know, just because you didn't know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've got an elephant joke, but I'll save it for next week. That's a good all right. one. That's a good one. All right. Well, the mightiest of all uh, Twitter princes is Andrew Malcolm, yeah. the prince of Twitter, the regent of redstate.com at AH Malcolm on Twitter. And, uh, you know, next week we'll be doing this the day before, we'll be recording the day before election day. So uh, oh, we'll, yeah. sum, we'll yeah. sum up. Uh... And, and, and hopefully that will be the end, although maybe not. Yeah, we might still be talking about it the next podcast. Because you know, of- this is this is a funny, funny anecdote. When I uh, asked my wife to marry me way back in the 80s, she was a journalist and I was a journalist. And uh, so she she was in charge of the wedding. I said, just tell me the time and where to go and I'll be there. I don't want anything to do with planning. So she planned it for late November because she knew by then all election coverage would be over. Right, but then, <laughs> but then, two thousand came, middle of December. I'm still working on the Bush campaign, actually, until the middle of January. So, uh, yeah, that. Who would have thought there was? Yeah, who'd have thunk, who'd have thunk it? Yeah. yeah, I tried that line on my wife too, but it didn't work. Yeah, <laughs> so I said, "You plan it all, and I'll just give me the date and time." She says that <laughs> you're dreaming, pal. <laughs> You you are gonna be you are gonna be doing some of the work here. I'm not doing all the work. It's like, dang, I that was a good line. <laughs> I, think, I, think, um, I think my wife was happy that I was not involved. <laughs> do we <laughs> need so, do we need so many flowers? Yeah, there you go. All right. Andrew Malcolm, we'll talk again next week. Hopefully the only time we'll the, the last time we'll talk about the election. Um and and uh, until we know what the results are but we'll see yeah. all they right can go on for a while all right thank you edward thanks everybody see you then don't forget to vote